well, her family isn't originally here, I found out. She's not part of the Burgundy Zara here, but it's all good. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. That introduction? <laughs> uh, I'm probably going to put the phone. Okay. Or the microphone. Um, yeah, so welcome everybody uh, to uh, what is newly called the Hub. Um, Queen City Hub's been operating for about two months now. Uh, we started in early January. And uh, by day, it's a co working space, so all of this is uh, set up as a shared office and desk space. Um, folks come here who work from home, freelancers, people who do, do contract work, um, artists, uh, web designers. Right. We've got a whole slew of people who come through here during the day to um, work and hang out with each other. Uh, and then at night, we use it as a community and event space. So it can be booked for events like this, or um, we'll partner with you on events that we also sort of want to support. Um, and yeah, so if you have any questions about the Hub, <clears throat> we're still building our membership and uh, would love to talk to you about sort of uh, what kind of office or meeting space or event space uh, you're looking for and how we can, <clears throat> excuse me, partner on that. So uh, catch me at the back if you're interested in chatting about this space or um, anything about the hub and uh, nothing about Bitcoins really because I know I like very little. Given time. <laughs> okay, yeah. I'm confident I'll learn. <clears throat> thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, I have to ask John. He's I gotta introduce John a little bit because he's the one who really put this together in regards to uh, getting a symposium happening. Um, John and I have been friends for 10 years and we both went through the University of Regina doing computer science. And he had found out that a lot of people were very interested in Bitcoin. And actually, uh, I come and visit him and talk to him a little bit of Bitcoin at the university a little bit. And so he decided, hey, wouldn't it be a great idea to have a variety of experts from Saskatchewan to come down and talk about what Bitcoin is, what its potential future, and probably maybe you'll educate and also alleviate some of the concerns they have in terms of security in regards to that. If you notice, Bitcoin has been around uh, in the news a lot lately, and there'll be quite a bit of discussion from the experts here. We're going to be kind of on the time schedule. We're actually doing good on time, which is great. Regardless of the technical difficulties, we do have a lot of subject matter experts here. If, if I sense out there there's a lot of people with a technical background who understand how uh, things can go wrong, so I hope you guys can really uh, uh, understand this right now. It is our first symposium. I can't wait for the next symposium. I'm sure it's about talking about dog coin, but nonetheless, it's all good. Okay, so um, I think I'll take it away. Uh, John, if you want me to start or start introducing the speakers, it's up to you. And uh, the uh, speakers can even introduce their, their own backgrounds too, and I hope I don't butcher anybody's names. Um, the first person uh, to my left that I just met today is Ethan Er. I can't say Perfect. that. Yeah, I'm John Travolta his name right now, so I apologize. What is your name, sir? Ethan O'Gallusian. Okay. I can't, can't pronounce it for the life of me. Like, for 10 minutes, I kept on saying his last name. I couldn't memorize it. Of course, there's John Klein at the very end. Uh, John, of course, a local blogger and IT professional. I also have to mention that Ethan is from Saskatoon, so I'm kind of bouncing around. He's the host of an American Bitcoin radio show, so he'll be very insightful about what's happening to our neighbors down in the south. He's skeptical. <laughs> we'll find out soon enough. Um, and of course, John Klein, local blogger and IT professional. He does work at the University of Regina. John Kozen, an accountant who's right there. He'll come up to the podium here. And he's an IT professional as well who has been using and mining Bitcoins. He's just an accountant, sorry. An accountant and who has been using and mining Bitcoins. And we have Marshall Ratchushniak, the technical aspect of the Bitcoin network that he will be speaking. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? Uh, almost exactly. Almost exactly. <laughs> Great. Um, unfortunately, uh, Danielle Banesh, even though I'm, I, I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, I'm sure he wouldn't mind if I said it wrong. Uh, he had a video presentation, but he couldn't uh, come here tonight. So we'll have him for the next symposium, as I will heard John. So we can start off. Um, I guess to the left of me, whoever's the first speaker, because it, we had a very uh, loose schedule. It's kind of informal and formal in the way. Uh, so John Klein to take it away, and he can probably speak from the mic that he has over there. Hello. Okay, yes, it works. Um, I know I can't see somebody at the back, so I'm just going to stand up so everybody gets more of the full effect. 
And if they ever get uh, things rolling with the with either the Mac or the Linux laptop, then, then we can see my uh, very pretty presentation with the graphics. But there's really only two graphics in the whole thing. So you're probably better off if I don't have to keep referring to the, uh, to the PowerPoint presentation anyway. Uh, I'm going to just explain initially uh, how you can possess Bitcoins. And the way you can do that is by having a Bitcoin wallet. Some of these people in the room, of course, would already know this, but I'm giving this as the like the baseline example of how you can get them because that's really the first step is getting a wallet. So working from memory for my presentation here, the next thing we need to, uh, it to understand about uh, wallets are you can either trust a website on online to uh, manage your wallet, or you can manage it yourself. And with Bitcoins, it's vastly more secure to manage it yourself. If you let another website manage it for you, you might end up losing all of your money. And there's no insurance for Bitcoin right now, like there is for money in a bank. So you end up losing all of your money. Uh, this happened to people, unfortunately, who used the website MT Gox, or as some people refer to it as Empty Gox. <laughs> and um, that, that's not my my uh, that's not my joke. It, it's uh, from a pirate party, a person who lost approximately I think one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in Empty Gox, uh, or what he could have pulled out had he pulled it out earlier when they had money. They may have mismanaged something. They may have robbed, gotten robbed. But so the thing to take away from this little part of the story. Oh, hey, look, my presentation is almost on the screen. Um, the, the important part to take away from it is that you don't have to trust somebody else to manage your wallet. Just like in real life, you wouldn't say, "Here, hold my wallet, and please give me money from it whenever I ask you." You can actually do that yourself, and you can do that by downloading the Bitcoin program. You just go to Bitcoin.org. And whether you have a Mac or a Linux laptop or a Windows desktop or a laptop at home, it has the software there for you for your computer. Hey John, you almost got that figured out, Harvey? Uh, no, we don't know how to use a Mac. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there must be an app for that. <laughs> You'd think so, you'd hope so. But one part of my presentation actually is that Apple has decided to kill their Bitcoin support on the iPhone or iPad. You can, if you have an Android device or, or a smart Android smartphone, you can still uh, can still use a, a, a website that I do trust called Blockchain. So you just need to scoot it over. And uh, just well, that's the problem is uh, we can't click sort on of an the top of the window. Sort of an exception to the rule of a website to manage your money it's in that they don't actually store your only yeah, copy it, it's of the wallet file and they don't have your yeah. password so that they can send money out of your wallet file even if they wanted to. So that's really the key is that you have to find a website that doesn't store your password and, and uh, have the ability to take your money out of your wallet file. So it doesn't really matter if they have your wallet file because it's encrypted. And you can have a copy of it too. So if their website goes offline, then that MP is offline, you still have the wallet file that you can put on your computer, access through the Bitcoin program, type in your password and send your money to wherever else you want to, and it's actually useful to you. Nathan, can you just unplug it from the wall? The um um, so I've already covered off smartphones. Just smart unplug phones. it so, so that we can stream it through the space. Have a smartphone, sorry, your SOL right now. Uh, until I think the uh, the wave of uh, Bitcoin will wash over Apple soon enough, and 
uh, they're going to put it back uh, because that's just seems to be the most likely what will happen. Um, everybody will be spending money and sorry. So, possessing the wallet, again, like you can download uh, the software, and that's where I started initially in, in about 2011 or 2010. A friend of mine got me really interested in Bitcoin, and I installed the, um, the Bitcoin program on my machine. I thought, oh boy, I, I, maybe I'm mining now, and maybe I'll be making money, and my wallet will fill up, and I'll have Bitcoins to spend. And, I really wish I'd done a little bit more research and actually <laughs> out of mine because at that time if I made a Bitcoin or two, I'd end up with a few thousand dollars in the bank today if I hadn't spent them. Oh, she's um, the projector. way you can um, uh, store money with a Bitcoin wallet, you uh, have it running on your screen. It says how what your balance is Which presently. And uh, it has an option, and it's a very, very simple program, Bitcoin. And you have the option to encrypt your wallet. When you encrypt it, you want to pick a really strong password. Uh, this means not like you know, one, two, three, four, five, like a combination on the luggage. It means uh, multi word password. So you want uh, something like the dog ran home because it was very fast. That would be a great password. Uh, and you could put in uh, spaces and numbers in a few spots if you want. Uh, one of the most secure passwords in the world that I've ever seen is uh, it's not a, a diplomatic history from 1966 to the present day. And that was uh, the password on the, the WikiLeaks. Uh, uh, on the WikiLeaks uh, unfortunately, it was published so in a quote, at which point it ceased being secure. Uh, so that was a, sort of a uh, well, no, mistake. Don't publish your password in the book. It's sort of number one for, uh, for password well, security in the world. Because it's really, really hard. Oh, there we go. Well, here we go. Anyway, so we'll just fly through the slides uh, really quickly because we're pretty much uh, on nearly the last one. I'm almost <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. well, we'll skip ahead uh, one slide here when you when you have a moment to tap on the uh, on the space bar or whatever advances things here. You can also put the mouse right there. Oh, I have a mouse. Oh yes, on the elbow. Can you hand me that mouse, please? Absolutely. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I think it's when it's time to sleep. There we go. Okay, so here you can actually see the websites I've been talking about. It because when I first uh, was told about blockchain.info, and because I have a bit of a head cold right now, you might have heard it as blogchain.info, and I first typed it in wrong, and I was sort of confused about something that had nothing to do with Bitcoin. But blockchain is a really interesting website in that you can see uh, what transactions are flying around in the world right now, even and it has information. Pretty much the entirety of Bitcoin you can look up and on that website. It's a, got a very public ledger aspect to it, which I think Marshall will go into detail soon about. Um, the We Use Coin site at the bottom here is a really uh, good place to go to get started uh, and just uh, find out what uh, a wallet means and what it looks like. But if you download one, uh, download the program and install it, you'll find out very quickly that you have a wallet.dat file on your computer. <coughs> Okay, there we go. See, Android and Blackberry support Bitcoin. I'm not sure if Windows phones do. I don't know if there's an app uh, available or if anyone has a Windows phone. And just saying, because I have a Blackberry, Berry depends on what you have. It has to be 10 or higher. Oh, okay, the 10 series are better. High and higher, nothing okay. below. Okay, good to know. Very big, the fancy new operating system ones are not, uh, not the older ones. <laughs> Okay, so what does a wallet look like? Here's one way to think of a wallet. A QR code. When you came in the door, for instance, you would have normally set up a few donation uh, wallets where you could, uh, if you had Bitcoin on your phone, you could point it at the QR code and say, I want to send this much to this address. And it just translates into this long string of numbers and letters, of hexadecimal or maybe not hexadecimal there, because they see a U, so. To this long string of uh, numbers and letters. And uh, 
that's how it knows where to send the network money. Yes, the Windows app. Oh, there is a Windows app that's been confirmed. So for the lucky or unlucky people <laughs> in the crowd with a Windows app, <laughs> you can use that too. Okay, so as I mentioned, you want to pick a strong passphrase and keep a backup of it. Um, I work at uh, the university uh, in IT, and you, I wouldn't want to tell you how many people have come to me with broken USB drives. And uh, uh, you remember floppy drives from back in the day and how often they'd, uh, they'd quit. Anyway, the uh, USB drives are not foolproof, and there's a particular brand that begins with an L that I think is really poor quality too, that they sell at Walmart, and you might want to avoid that one too if you want longevity from your uh, USB drive. Uh, and I know somebody who had Bitcoin on a failed USB drive. Fortunately, there's a, uh, a program called PhotoRec that's free that uh, was able to recover the file. It rebuilds things nicely in many cases. Uh, so you can also make uh, backups of your wallet that aren't on USB drive or on hard drive or on CD or DVD. You can make a paper wallet. You can print it out and then store that in a waterproof container in a fireproof container and uh, keep it at your home. Uh, the other thing to remember is not to keep all of your eggs in one basket. Since wallets are free, you may as well make more than one of them. John, what's a, what do you mean by a paper wallet? A paper wallet, I haven't looked into it in great detail. Someone else here might want to feel like a question. I have mine at my law firm right now, and I'd like a paper I, wallet as well, but I don't know what that I is. I can answer that. You, the easiest way to go about getting yourself a, a paper wallet as a backup is to use um, uh, it's called Armory, which is like, uh, it, it runs on Bitcoin QT as your main wallet, but it runs on top of it, and it has all kinds of security features in, built into it. And so one of the things that when you first create your wallet, it gives you the option to create a, a, a paper wallet. You, you say yes, and it prints out a copy with your QR code, and also the whole string of all the digits, that if the QR code doesn't work, then you can actually manually enter it, and it just recovers it. Because all that information is stored in the blockchain. Okay. Right? It's not and it's really accessed by a password, I yeah. assume. So yeah, and it will ask you for your password for the so and then you're in. If you have wallets right now on a USB, you just create a new wallet with paper wallet, transfer the funds across sure. and that would print sure. out. And then that acts as a hard copy? Yes, yes. you have a hard yeah. copy. Exactly. You have a hard copy. It's, yeah. it's a okay. paper copy. Because, yeah, in some cases, um, digital is more dangerous yeah. Than, uh, yeah. than analog. And, and, and backing up something that's not really that large, like it would feel fit on one sheet of paper, I assume. So, yeah, oh yeah, it's just how, it depends on how many it. keys you have in your wallet and how many transactions. So, I, th I think it just references the blockchain, and the blockchain has all that information. It's actually right? your so private key. Yeah. It's yeah. your private key printed out. So oh, it's like yeah. having your private key in a wallet, exactly. that file, which it could be key logged or, or whatever, it's on paper. So, so also the private key has never been on a computer, ever. Yeah, so then it can't be hacked uh, by which that means that that don't include physical presence. Yeah, you can also make them on blockchain. Though. On blockchain, Excellent. you can make them too. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, so, as I mentioned, just don't put all of your eggs in one basket. That's the big mistake that the uh, Alberta exchange or whatever it was made that lost the six hundred thousand dollars worth, because it sounds like they had everything in a hot wallet where it, all their eggs were literally in one basket. And when that basket got smashed, they were eggless. <laughs> so don't let that happen to you. Just, just move your money into more than one space. And uh, that's, any, that's it. Uh, if anybody has any other questions about wallets, I'd be happy to uh, try to answer it or have another expert from the crowd uh, jump in. Excellent. Thank you. Right on time, too. Um, and, uh, Marshall will be up there shortly. Uh, take your time. Meet your neighbor. Actually, the great thing about the symposium is like we have collective knowledge of, I would consider very smart people here who want to understand not only what Bitcoin is, but also to like forge relationships. When you work in IT, I understand that it can be very lonely, um, not stereotypically lonely uh, profession, but uh, if you get to know people, it's, it's a great thing. That's why we have social media, yes, I get to be funny. So yeah, I'm, I'm an enigma. I like talking and I also like IT, so it's, it's okay. But um, help yourself to some snacks, and we'll, I'll call you guys 
back for their next speaker. We're on time, so thank you. So, uh, Marshall, are you ready to go? Yes, I am. Okay, Marshall was born ready to do this presentation, and his is more about uh, how do you mine Bitcoin, am I correct? It's more, more on the, uh, the underlying concepts that actually make it work. Okay, absolutely. Cryptography, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be super awesome in a way that I'm very interested in as well. So take it away, take your time, it's all good. And also, uh, you use the red microphone if you want. So, so, uh... A friend uh, uh, sent me a link to a Vineyard Cave comic uh, earlier today, uh, and this was th this lovely little quote was uh, in the, uh, the write up that accompanied it, and it's it's accurate. <laughs> uh, Fortunately, abstractions don't uh, are, aren't governed by Euclidean space. <laughs> Oops. Uh, so it's kind of a cheap trick of uh, a lot of, uh, of seemingly uh, a lot of presenters to start out with a dictionary definition of what they're talking about. Uh, cryptography is Greek for secret writing or hidden writing because uh, apparently there are a lot of uh, people like to uh, use Greek words for things. Uh, the rest is uh, terminology. Plain text is the actual message uh, that he wants to uh, uh, that he wants the recipient to uh, to read or hear or watch or whatever kind of message it is. Um, the cipher text is the is the term for the encrypted message. Ideally, the ciphertext looks like just uh, completely random noise, uh, and which gives no clues as to uh, what it actually means to someone. Uh, plain text is turned into ciphertext and back using an encryption algorithm or a cipher with a key. There is uh, there's actually a, uh, an encryption algorithm called Rock 13, or Rotate 13 Places, uh, where you take the, a written message and you rotate each letter 13 around the alphabet. And so there is no key. It's You just apply Rock 13 and it obscures the text. Um, you apply it again, and it decrypts the text. The text. Uh, that's uh, that's a good way of hiding uh, spoilers that someone might not want to accidentally read. Do you want me to come do this way? Uh, sure. The next okay. one. Uh, since about the seventies, I believe, um, cryptography, uh, cryptographic algorithms have been. Uh, um, Discussed in term uh, with names rather than party A sends a message to party B. Uh, a passive eavesdropper intercepts uh, the message and analyzes it, or a malicious attacker interrupt intercepts the message, say a letter in the mail, modifies it, and then sends it on to party B. No, it's Alice, Bob, Eve, Mallory. Um, Trent, Victor, and so on, for various um, roles. Uh, just one? just wave when you're ready. Uh, the uh, the simplest and oldest broad family of encryption is symmetric key cryptography or private key cryptography. There's one key used to either use both to encrypt and decrypt the message. Um, and Alice and Bob need to share, need, need to both know that key beforehand 
before, um, before they can communicate over an insecure channel. Um, can everyone read that at the bottom? It's tiny. Very, very. Uh, it's, uh, it, oh, and your credit got cut off too. Um, <laughs> that, it's a, uh, uh, part, an excerpt from a uh, strip, a comic strip from xkc.com. There's a, um, uh, Randall Monroe used to work for NASA on robots <coughs> and he, um, for us stick figure web comics. <laughs> That I, uh, I won't happen to find is very funny. Here it's a woman saying, Before you so quickly label me a third party to communication, just remember I loved him first. We had something and she tore it away. She is the attacker, not me, not Eve. Brennan <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, Monroe uh, says, I I'm not sure. If it's true that he's uh, he, he's not allowed to speak at cryptography conferences. <laughs> Could you hit the next one? Now here's where things start to get a little weird. Uh, some very smart guys in the 70s came up with uh, a completely different type of cryptography. Uh, it's asymmetric. You don't generate a single key. You generate a key pair. Uh, usually um, keep one as your own personal secret that you don't share with anyone, and the other one you broadcast the world, you shout it from rooftops. Um, <coughs> the, uh, one key can be, if, if one key is used to turn plain text into ciphertext, only the other key can turn the ciphertext back into plain text. The next one. Um, I mentioned Mallory earlier, a uh, a malicious uh, attacker, a um, a man in the middle, a um, someone who can modify your the communications in transit. Uh, asymmetric cryptography can uh, can be used to uh, prove message authenticity. The uh, something encrypted using a public key can only be decrypted by you. So anyone in the world can, can encrypt something that that can only be read by you. And you can encrypt something that, well, anyone in the world can read, but they'll know it's, but they'll know it was you. I, uh, I, I left off uh, prevent force fires. <laughs> Bitcoin uses this, uh, and there are actually two things on this slide that are technically incorrect, but I, I left out certain trees so to give you a clear, clear review of the forest. Uh, you generate a key pair. One of those keys becomes your Bitcoin address that people, uh, people you can use to send Bitcoins to you. The, um, so instead of private, public key is private key, they're called address and key respectively. Uh, and you need to use your private key to prove that uh, you're the person behind the public key. Uh, you use your key to prove that you're the person um, controlling that Bitcoin address in order to be able to spend Bitcoins. Uh, there are uh, some number of Bitcoins that have been sent to addresses that no one controls, and those Bitcoins will stay at those addresses forever. They've been uh, ac uh, accidentally, and, and uh, the person sending them, unfortunately, removed from the money supply. Um, the, it's the message saying that, that, that I, the person who controls this, Bitcoin address wants to send 
this much to that Bitcoin address that gets encrypted using the uh, private key. Decrypted using the Bitcoin address. And then anyone in the world can, well, anyone in the world's computer can very easily verify that it was in fact you and not someone else who uh, uh, created that transaction. Uh, asymmetric cryptography is one of the two um, cryptographic concepts ne uh, necessary to understand in order to understand how Bitcoin works. The other is called, called a cryptographic hashing function. These go by a few different names. Um, message Digest, which is what the MD and MD5 stands for. The SHA and uh, SHA-1 or SHA-256 stands for Secure Hash Algorithm. I don't remember what right MD stands for, although it is a uh, uh, it, it is an acronym. Those are different. Uh, those are all different. Message Digest. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I, I think so. Uh, I'm not sure what the RIPE stands for, but uh, now, just to be clear, uh, a um, take uh, say this uh, the file that this presentation is stored in and. Uh, calculate the SHA-256 hash of it, that will be different from its write MD-160 hash. Uh, they, uh, they are different ways of doing the same thing. They're doing different, they're different things that serve the same purpose. Um, You can hash anything, and we you, you can generate you, you can you can generate a, a digest of any message and a, any length of message, even the zero the zero length message, uh, e even a DVD image, uh, and that won't change the length of the digest. It'll be 256 bits for SHA-256, 160 for right MD-160. I think it's 160 <coughs> for MD-5. Uh, the long, the, the relatively long um, uh, digest length is one of the things that makes it a cryptographic hashing function. But the really critical part is the butterfly effect. Uh, apparently, computer scientists call this the avalanche effect in this case. But change the if, if, you change, uh, uh, if even one bit gets corrupt and gets split from zero to one or one to zero in the original message, the digest will be completely different. Uh, there's and there is no way, no way to know which uh, which bit it was that got flipped and flip it back. Uh, cut off was uh, credit uh, to uh, Wikimedia Commons. Um, the uh, The messages are fox, the red fox jumps over the blue dog, the red fox jumps over the blue dog with a U replaced with a V, the red fox jumps over the blue dog with the V and the E and or swapped, or the V left out, and this is an illustration of the, uh, the digests are all completely different. Hmm. 
So no hints. <laughs> um, it, it, it's right or it's wrong. Um, <coughs> close only counts in uh, horseshoes, hand grenades, and uh, most of academia. <laughs> <laughs> So just to be clear, you most likely won't find a message with a given hash in your lifetime. Given this hash, find a message that has that hash. That's only true for cryptographic hash algorithms. And there are uh, much quicker, simpler ones like CRC32 that I think, uh, uh, I, I believe zip files use. Uh, just to uh, just ju just to detect accidental data corruption, not predict, n n not not to uh, n not to detect uh, uh, the work of Mallory, n n not not to not to detect uh, someone deliberately changing the message. For SHA two fifty six, there are uh, the number of possible hashes is a seventy nine digit number. Um, computers are very good at uh, doing repetitive things quickly. Not anywhere near that good. You can try, but you probably won't find one in your lifetime with any of the computing hardware that will exist within your lifetime. I'm sorry to interrupt. You have two minutes left. Okay. Are you ready? We can stretch it. We can stretch it, but nice timekeeper. <coughs> the uh, a cryptographic nonce is a little bit uh, a, a little bit of data um, uh, appended to or included into a communication to basically make the uh, hash somehow completely different. If you append a nonce, uh, you will completely change the message's hash. If you use a different nonce, even a slightly different nonce, you'll get a completely different hash. But now, half of all hashes start with a zero bit. First bit's a zero. For the other half of the hash, the first bit's a one. That's, that, that, be pretty simple to understand. The quarter, half of those also have also have a zero for the second bit. So a quarter of the time, the hashes will start with two zero bits, and eighth of the time they'll start with three zero bits. And. Once in over 65,000 times, we'll start with 16 zeros. That is within the realm of now trying to find a, trying to find uh, a nonce that will give your message leading 16 zeros is within the realm of uh, possibility for consumer hardware within a reasonable amount of time. Uh, if you have it, it, uh, your computer can do five, can calculate five thousand hashes per second. Uh, a reasonable, probably in the order, uh, probably on the same order of magnitude as of, uh, what you get. Then you can find a non, you can find such a nonce that give your whatever message you want sixteen being zeros in about eight seconds, but not instantly. But someone else can verify that you've uh, done that, that you've done, that your computer has done that work instantly. And that's what Bitcoin mining is. <laughs> the um, the, tra uh, the transactions get uh, all the transactions that 
uh, people have created, people people uh, saying and cryptographically proving uh, who they are saying, I want to send this much Bitcoin to that address. Uh, those transactions get uh, get grouped together into a block. The block, uh, the block app gets a um, uh, a nonce included with it, and all the Bitcoin miners in the world try to find a nonce that will give the um, that that will give that block well, more like forty or fifty zeros. As I said, all of the Bitcoin miners in the world. The, um, the difficulty uh, adjusts, though, uh, dynamically by uh, rules tacitly agreed upon by, uh, by everyone on the Bitcoin network. The um, if someone creates a block that doesn't have enough leading zeros and broadcasts it, then then everyone else on the network will simply reject it. It's it's just noise. It's it's not valid. Uh, the uh, Block, tar uh, block target time is 10 minutes, and the network <laughs> dynamically adjusts based on the time the, the, uh, time stamps included in the blocks <coughs> to maintain a an average of one block being generated every 10 minutes. The, uh, the rules for that difficulty adjustment. Uh, are immutable. The difficulty itself has been increasing, uh, it, it actually it's been something like doubling every month or two lately. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, we have one more minute, if that's okay. If you can wrap it up in, in conclusion with one more minute, that'd be swell. The, uh, The, bit, the uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever he actually is, and in my opinion, that's still not certain. Uh, saw a problem that he wrote actually on the first page of his fairly dense uh, nine-page paper, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Um, and it's his view that the problem with traditional um, traditional banking system when applied to online transactions was that it's centralized. Everyone, everyone uh, sending money online needs to trust some third party. There needs to be a trend. Uh, and the, uh, the blockchain is a uh, it, it, it is a response to that, a, 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 different, a, a different way. It's completely decentralized. There is no one who can, uh, who, who, who can give you the Bitcoins back if you send them to the wrong address. Uh, there's also no one who can stop you from uh, uh, donating to WikiLeaks or, uh, you know, uh, or, or, or freezer. Uh, or a freezer account uh, for reasons unspecified, and you don't have to uh, search long to find uh, many, many um, PayPal horror stories. It was Satoshi's view that uh, uh, financial institutions cannot avoid mediating disputes, um, and he proposed a technical uh, solution to that problem. Seems to have taken off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Marshall. Really appreciate it.
photography is not an easy thing to discuss. It is very, you have to really follow it and really have to, he has obviously a brilliant mind uh, in regards to, he understands it, right? It's really hard to translate. Kudos to you, man. Like, I, you gave the broken down of it. It made sense. Like, the way you used the sentencing to explain, it was really awesome. So, I think we can take at least a five minute break. We can. I want you guys to eat something. I also want you guys to get to know each other. Just sitting around like, presentation. during a meeting. I know I'm handsome, but it's okay. Mine Go get some continues on yours and we'll be back for a little bit time. Good. My presentation is uh, it's a little bit less technical. It's still a lot of technical details of Bitcoin, but I've only got one slide of hash functions. So, uh, me, I am John Cogan. I'm a chartered accountant. So practitioner here in Germany. Um, so I don't know if you guys saw this um, a day or two ago on the Conan O'Brien show. They were trying to explain Bitcoin to Conan. So here are the quotes they came up with. Uh, it's quite simple. Bitcoin is a decentralized digital currency exchanged in the interactive metaverse. Of course, but, but in layman's terms, it's an open source synergistic flow matrix facilitating the e-transference of digital assets. Um, right. So imagine you're in a snow globe where each snowflake is a unique coin opportunity. <laughs> so uh, I really think there is no such thing as a Bitcoin. What it is really is just a distributed public ledger, uh, permanent record of every transaction between accounts. And <clears throat> I think John is Point out, you can go to blockchain.info, blockexplorer.com, look up every single transaction ever. It's actually quite interesting to follow the coins around. You can go look up the coins that the FBI took. You can find the original coins as traced through the system. Kind of like Wikipedia, you don't get sucked in. Clicking on <laughs> Hash functions. Text goes in, something else comes out. I think we've been over this. Uh, so uh, you're in the, on the ledger, your account number is this um, uh, Bitcoin address, which I think we've explained so far. A bit, a bit. So a few interesting things about this. Uh, Bitcoin addresses use a new base 58 encoding where they've actually taken out letters that look similar, like ones and lowercase l's, as well as zeros and O's, so when you're writing them down, you don't mistake a zero for a no. Mm. <clears throat> so uh, when you generate an address, you can actually generate an address offline, because you don't need to be connected to the network. Uh, it's just generated by the, the uh, cryptographic functions. <clears throat> and there's a total combination of 10 to the 48 possible <clears throat> addresses. That's, that's a lot. So the, uh, the chances that you're going to generate the same address that somebody else has already generated is very, very low. So that is a large number. So this is what a transaction looks like on the blockchain. Um, so this is just a random transaction I pulled up. It's kind of hard to see there, but we have... This is actually 75... I'll be a fan of, a fan of for you. <laughs> this is actually 75... Uh, Bitcoin transaction for 75 bitcoins, and it was sent for, a, which is about, how much, how much money? 49. $50,000, and it was sent for a fee of 7 cents. So, right there, that's pretty interesting. But, um, so here we can see that coins are just being assigned from one account to uh, the other account. And actually, you, when sending coins, the whole coin must be redeemed at the same time. You can't spend part of a bitcoin in your account. So the bottom transaction on the output is actually a change address that's sending the extra coins back to the original sender. And each transaction is linked to the previous time it has been sent. So if you look, and you click the output here, it shows you these 39 coins that were being sent here were originally received in this transaction. So they were sent from here to there, and then up to here, and then here they are here. So in this transaction, you can't really see it, but there's a 50 bitcoins in the input, 49.999 in the output, so that's a transaction fee of that. 
So because Bitcoin is a decentralized system and you don't have to trust anyone, it's quite, it's like, how do you do that? How do you not trust anyone and still have, maintain the integrity of the system, right? So that's what Bitcoin miners are doing. So um, <clears throat> each transaction is signed by the cryptographic uh, keys that we've discussed earlier. And what that does is it allows you to prove that you own the, the private key to that address without revealing the key. And miners also verify that um, the coins have not been sent to somebody else. No, but, but doing this takes computing power, so why would miners do this? Because they get Bitcoins for doing it. So each time, uh, uh, they, so when you originally send a transaction, it is not included in the official history of Bitcoin immediately. It's just broadcast to every, every node that you know of, and it's up to a miner to include it in the history of Bitcoin. So once it's verified, um, a miner will include it in a block, a block of the, his the history is written one block at a time every 10 minutes. And that's when new, new coins are created. That's kind of the reward for miners verifying these transactions. <clears throat> so we discussed earlier is one block per 10 minutes. Um, and we've discussed the, the calculations that miners are doing. They're trying to find, find the code for the next set of <clears throat> blocks in the chain and receive that reward. Uh, the difficulty factor we, we've discussed. So why doesn't everyone just mine Bitcoin? Then it's 25 created every 10 minutes. That's, that's a lot of money. It's two and a half million dollars a day approximately. Uh, and that's that's why the difficulty factor is just so it's so everyone can't generate bitcoins all at once because it's generating bitcoins is difficult. So you're doing this calculation. Uh, this is actually a chart of hash rate of the total network, and you can see it really took off uh, at the end of last year when when ASICs came up. But I'll explain what that is. <coughs> and the jagged line is the difficulty increasement every every two weeks. So the calculation to find the bitcoins gets harder and harder. So because it's a distributed uh, system, you know we're, we're trying to keep the integrity of the system uh, going, make sure you know we don't have to trust anyone, um, and yet still have a functioning system. So. Um, because miners are verifying these transactions, it, it, theoretically, if you had over 50% of the total computing power of the Bitcoin network, you would be able to write your own history and do things like make your own transactions, uh, manipulate transactions, not include other people's transactions. So that's why it's really important that the computing power is distributed between a, as large number of people as possible. Because if you're trying to rewrite the, write your own <laughs> blocks and you know, fudge transactions, you're racing against the computing power of everyone else in the world, and it's the world's most distrib fastest distributed uh, supercomputer. So it's that's quite the challenge. <clears throat> so each time a transaction is included in a block, uh, there is a possibility that that, that could be reversed uh, if the blockchain is forked, for example, or if someone is attacking the network, and they can add on their own blocks to the official chain, and um, technically whatever chain is the longest becomes the official chain. Uh, so uh, you might see confirmations referenced in your client, and that is just how many blocks have been created after your transaction has been included in the block. So the further back in the block chain your transaction is, if it's six, uh, usually the little, most people will say six after six confirmations, that is not being reversed because it'd just be too much computing power to go back and rewrite the whole blockchain history from six blocks ago. So once you're after 10 blocks, there is no chance of that transaction being reversed. It's also hard to match the timestamp. Right, timestamp um, can be manipulated. It's up to each miner. Not to but the the block. Almost impossible. Yeah, timestamps in the block are not reliable. <coughs> Uh, so mining hardware, people have been asking me, how, how can you mine, how can I mine Bitcoin? It seems like uh, a good thing to do. It's free money coming out of nowhere. So originally, people were mining on their just regular computers. So the difficulty was so low 
that one regular computer could find a block but, you know, on its own uh, fairly easily. But as more and more people started mining, the difficulty went way up to keep that block rate generation at 10, once every 10 minutes. So things got harder. So people realized, hey, we can mine on graphics cards because a graphics card is just a thousand tiny little processors. So let's mine on that instead. But they use quite a bit of power. So um, the next step was they took the, the Bitcoin hashing algorithm, uh, I think it's SHA 2 inputs, and they put that into a custom ASIC, or application-specific integrated circuit. So they made a chip that only does the Bitcoin calculation. Point of order, you missed one. FPGAs. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an arms race. Yeah. Um, you, by the way, you guys have seen the little device on the back table there. There's a small ASIC miner back there as well. If you want to yes, take a look at it after me. Example back uh, so, solo mining versus cool mining. Um, solo mining, you'd be looking for a block by yourself. And it could take years, decades, possibly not at all. It's just completely random whether you're going to find the code of that block or not. And you're probably not going to. You're guessing the nuts. Yeah. So, uh, don't, don't solo mine. <laughs> so, what, what you do instead of that is join a mining pool where your computing power uh, is um, cool with, with other, other miners in the network. And whenever Sorry. one miner in your pool finds a block, that block will work. I'll do this from the side. There. Among all the miners. Where's, we're going to plug this in. Over here. Let's take it. Marshall right here. Right there. What's happening here is every computer science guy's nightmare. We, need, we still need power, so. <laughs> so it's a good thing. Very good. Okay. Oh, so is this profitable? CPU mining? No. Do not mine on your CPU. I guess it's if there are some. To learn, you can learn. And then not make anything. <laughs> You'll learn how much your power bill is. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, GPUs, no, maybe for alternative coins um, that use a different hashing algorithm, like the, the S-crypt. I'll explain that in a second. Uh, ASICs, yes, ASICs are profitable miner right now. The hardware is expensive, but it is, like I said, it's two million dollars a day worth of Bitcoin being generated, so it is big business. So here are some pictures. This is not me. This is just somebody's GPU mining rig. and. Uh, Bitcoin miners like to make the most with the, the least cost. So this computer doesn't even have a case, or it's got five graphics cards you know, hooked up to this motherboard, and that's it. Uh, next, these are ASIC chips. These are exactly where we got the back right now. These are the block erupters. And that, this one chip on this USB stick has almost as much power as one of those graphics cards and uses much, much less power. So now they, uh, they've just taken that and put it growing it exponentially, and there's huge mining operations right now. Um, so I mentioned alternative coins. So, uh, since Bitcoin is open source, anyone can take a copy of it, change the name, change some of the <laughs> details of it, and make a new coin. So Litecoin is, kind of, is often cited as the silver to Bitcoin's gold. It's exactly like Bitcoin, except it uses a different hashing algorithm, the S-Crypt, instead of the SHA-256. And it has a block time of two and a half minutes instead of 10 minutes, uh, 50 coins per block currently instead of in, as compared to Bitcoin's current 25. And there'll be a maximum of 82 million Litecoins uh, as compared to um, Bitcoin's 21 million. Litecoin's currently worth $424 million. Okay, you have a two minute warning, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, we're, we're getting close. Dogecoin, wow, it's my favorite. <laughs> One minute blocks, 100,000 coins per block, and actually no cap on the amount of Dodge coins that will ever exist. It's currently worth $47 million for some reason. People love that. <laughs> much, love that much more. <laughs> so um, if you can see this, this is uh, coinmarketcap.com. It's just the top 10 alternative currencies 
sorted by uh, market uh, cap descending. Uh, Bitcoin at the top, this is from last night, $7.8 billion. Which, if, if WhatsApp is worth $19 billion and Bitcoin's worth under eight, does that seem right to anyone? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Litecoin, Aurora coin, that's the official coin of Iceland. Iceland. <laughs> Unofficial. Uh, Doge. Uh, some other interesting technologies in the blockchain, um, based on this blockchain technology, Namecoin is a distributed DNS system. So instead of moving values around from account to account, we're actually storing, actually any text you want can be stored in the blockchain. So. Uh, it can be used as a distributed DNS uh, server, which you know, if you've seen, uh, the FBI routinely seizes domain names from anyone they feel like, really. Uh, so <laughs> the only thing that really is stopping Namecoin right now is that it requires a browser plugin to use, so, so no one uses it. Not anymore. Oh, go to meowbit.com. <laughs> uh, so, so this Bitcoin proof of work algorithm, you know, the mining algorithm, uses quite a bit of energy. So some, you know, environmental type people are concerned about how much energy Bitcoin is actually using. Uh, so there's new proof of stake coins, which um, generate coins based on what you have, not what, not based on what you're computing. So that's fairly interesting too. And then there's some next generation uh, cryptocurrencies, NXT, uh, Ethereum is really interesting. It's basically a programming language plus Bitcoin, um, programmable money, financial contracts is very, very exciting. Cool. Uh, just a few final thoughts. Uh, trust no one with your Bitcoin, with your private keys. Um, so we're five years in, I think this is just the beginning. I think everyone here is an early adopter and uh, this thing is really gonna change the world. Also, I think, Dorian, I don't, I don't think it's Satoshi, but I think we are all Satoshi Nakamoto. <laughs> Spread the word. This is, this is it, right here. This is what it's all about. Thank you. Are we going to have a lot of people in the house? I just love you in the house, man. So, we're going to have our next speaker soon. Thank you, John. That was awesome, actually. Uh, I like his entertaining style, which is a Really quite good. Try. Yeah, it's good. He's remember he's accounted by trade. He likes mining, using Bitcoin. So if you have any questions, you can ask him as well. We're gonna have a question session afterwards. It is right now uh, eight twenty-seven, and I believe we're talking to Ethan. Ethan is our next speaker. He gets the L mic, the special mic. I do. Oh yes. I'll probably walk around up there. I'll use okay, use the right one. It's okay. It's fine. <laughs> it's okay. So uh, Ethan hails from Saskatoon. He does his American Bitcoin uh, radio show and take away Ethan and um yeah go ahead. Hey Ethan, how's it going? So I don't make presentations because one time I tried to and the computer ate it. That was eight hours gone. Don't do that. So my name is Ethan Revolution, I host uh, uh, Let's Talk Bitcoin's Ed and Ethan's Bitcoin Report. It airs on KCAA 1050 AM in Loma Linda, California, and we get to joke with our listeners all the time about how, yes, it's freezing up here, so we get to run Bitcoin miners really fast. Very efficient. <laughs> I am, I, I don't want to talk about the technical side of Bitcoin because frankly, my skill level in understanding all of that pales in comparison to what's here at the table. I am not a technical guy. My interest in Bitcoin is economic. I love Bitcoin because I also love gold and I love silver. I love these sorts of things that are independent, free financial instruments that free people from depending on, eh, let's call it, questionable managers of monetary supplies. <laughs> I think um, something a lot of you might not know is that Canada's money supply has doubled in just 10 years. Double! That's actually really huge. Has our economy doubled in size? You might ask yourself, maybe it has, maybe it hasn't. But at the very least, that monetary supply increasing in such a huge fashion is something a lot of people have no awareness of. 
So I've been sitting up here thinking, what am I going to talk about? Because when I go to talk about Bitcoin, I usually just respond to questions. I don't really have a plan. It's probably another reason I don't make those. But I guess what's really intriguing about this is I kind of like Bitcoin because it lets you break all the rules. There's a lawyer here, is that right? No. No? You have a law firm though, right? No, uh, no, I have a law firm holding my bitcoins. That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. It's better than Mt. Gox. Um, it's interesting to me because it lets you break all the rules. So I like to say a lot of things that get people's hair standing up on end. Things like, I don't think money laundering is a crime. <laughs> a lot of people really don't like hearing that, but I really don't think it is because it boils down to something very simplistic for me. Money is a way of communicating value. So if I give somebody here a dollar, there's a really simple message that takes place. I'm a dollar poorer, nothing unusual, and you are a dollar wealthier. We both understand what took place, right? If you boil it down to communication, to me, money laundering is basically kind of like looking at everybody's email for the sake of making moral judgments given the power of law. So here, we might not like it that somebody buys a kilogram of cocaine with Bitcoin, and in Saudi Arabia, somebody might not like it that a woman buys a car with Bitcoin. Whatever the case, Bitcoin really takes away that power to monitor your monetary communications. This is about breaking all the rules. So banks launder money quite a lot. We know that. We know that banks have a preferential sort of treatment of the rules as well, right? They're too big to jail. If you jail bankers, people will lose jobs. Ah! <laughs> the sky will fall. Bitcoin takes away everything we depend on in respect to a centralized banking system. It takes away the need to trust people who may have a vested interest in buying the conventional power structure, that is government, a central clearinghouse of wealth and influence. Well, influence. Um, so if I wanted to move a great deal of wealth across the world in a frictionless fashion, Bitcoin is a system I would want to use. Banks, well, there are lots of fees, there's lots of oversight, there's a lot of friction. And a lot of this is kind of a consequence. A lot of this is a consequence of all of those sorts of moral judgments we've given the power of law and use our, our traditional monetary systems to enforce. So, so when it comes to uh, things like friction in a payment system, this is what Bitcoin gets rid of. It really dashes this to pieces. So. You have this situation where you've got uh, a traditional monetary instrument and you think you can use it to control people's spending habits. As a result, you create a lot of friction. You demand oversight, you demand regulation, you demand that people look at transactions, audit transactions, that they uh, meet a certain uh, test of legitimacy. That's all friction. All of that is friction. And the Bitcoin network tosses it aside. That really does trouble a lot of people, but for me, it's something glorious and wonderful. So, I guess what I think Bitcoin really boils down to is sort of like uh, a beautiful anarchy. Speakers here have already detailed why you don't have to trust anybody on the Bitcoin network. It's all cryptography, it's decentralized, you really don't have to worry about somebody's opinion uh, determining what you can do with your wealth. And I really think that is immensely powerful. There are, of course, many, many, many other applications for the Bitcoin protocol, things like decentralized escrow, uh, Namecoin was mentioned. Again, I want to throw meowbit.com, which is run by a friend of mine. He uh, develops this wonderful uh, application you can run on your computer to browse.bit domains. And those can't be taken away by any centralized force, like I can which is, as far as I'm concerned, a way to say, I can take your domain. So, I think this is just very disturbing for some people, and it upsets our traditional monetary system, forces us to question what money is really about. 
So I come back to that communications protocol. To me, Bitcoin is anti-censorship. It's very free speech. Uh, I just started speaking in Doge. But it's, it's very, very much about free speech. It's very much about taking away all of those controls that we have over our communication, things that we are very accustomed to, and casting them aside, completely making them irrelevant. And I think that's a glorious, wonderful thing. So that's my perspective. It's all about economics. It's all about people being able to do what they please with their wealth. And this is something that I think Bitcoin enables. Maybe I should have made a try of presentation. Might have gone a little longer. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you. You're actually quite on time because uh, everything worked out. It's quite on time. Thank you. So uh, everyone has opinions in regards to Bitcoin. If we can have some of our speakers come back up and maybe answer a couple of questions from the crowd. Yes, I am single. But anyway, um, uh, come on up and uh, I think we'll start off with anyone out in the crowd. We'll use the red microphone actually. If you can go to the corner there and introduce yourself, say where you're here, that'd be great. I am. Um, my name is Dante. I'm a miner. I'm a firm guy here. I've also been to a couple of uh, uh, Bitcoin events, one in Las Vegas um, in December and then the Miami Bitcoin conference, and I do listen to uh, the talk Bitcoin for a bit, and do this, and talk about the talk was like a hero. So really appreciate you guys, like you know, coming up and everybody showing up and doing the Bitcoin thing. It's really cool. Uh, there's quite a few people here that I know in the city that are miners, etc. But my question is um, technical. Um, the whole fee thing in the protocol itself is a little bit confusing, uh, and. In a way, like you know, the, the talk is you can frictionless. I like that idea a lot. You know, just pull things across the world uh, for a one cent fee. But in Bitcoin QT in the wallet, when you go to send even a small amount of bitcoins, the fee that comes up that you pretty much have to pay, you can't get by it. Uh, varies. 0 0.001, nothing. 0 0.0004, whatever, nothing. But or nothing at all. Anybody explain that? I can answer that actually. So the, the transaction fee is based on a few things, and one of them is actually how old your coins are. So if you have brand new coins that have been mined recently, so if you said you're a miner, you probably have new coins. Yeah. New coins actually require a larger transaction fee. Then older coins uh, are more trusted on the network, so they don't require as much of a fee. The other thing that might affect your transaction fee is the size of the block. I think it's actually based on the um, per kilobyte. Great, almost. Yeah, so, so if exactly you have right. lots of inputs or lots of outputs, that, that just uses up more space in the blockchain. It's, it's a larger file size. So um, the network will demand a higher fee. Hmm. I was looking at that recently, and uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, there are three conditions that uh, need to, all need to be met in order for a transaction to be free. Uh, it needs to be. Um, Every, uh, every, uh, every address that, uh, it's being, uh, that Bitcoin is being sent to has to be receiving at least one bit sent, one one hundredth of a Bitcoin. Um, uh, it has to have, um, the transaction has to be under a kilobyte and the, tran uh, the, uh, the inputs, uh, input or inputs uh, have to be um, have at least one Bitcoin day. That's um, if you're spending one Bitcoin that you've had for uh, that, that's been at your address for less than a day. You know, it's not a Bitcoin day, but uh, two Bitcoins for half a day, or one Bitcoin for one day, or uh, a tenth of a Bitcoin for that you've had at, that's been sitting at your address for at least ten. Um, Um, for these ten days, the, um, the uh, if you don't meet those all three of those criteria, you have mm. to pay um, one ten thousandth of a bitcoin per kilobyte. Mm. Currently, that's fixed, but they're uh, they're working on a smart uh, uh, fee mechanism that. Uh, Will uh, will make the fees uh, completely dynamic. Hey, can I ask just one follow-up question? Who gets the fees? 
the, mind the person who cracks that block. Mm -hmm. The person who cracks the block finds the right knots. Okay, uh, but I'm a miner and I, like... You don't get things? Well, not that I know of. Well, if you look at your pool, are you, are you pool, still pool mining or pool, pool mining? No pools, yeah. Pools yeah. usually keep the fees. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Not all pools, pools although when the fees. block comes in, you can actually look on the pool's ledger and it'll show how much was received. And generally, it's, it'll be 25.23 bitcoins, and the 23 is all the transactions from those blocks. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the block reward. Or some and then the fees are just back on the Right. Fees are typically attached to the block reward because every time somebody sends the block, of course, being a page in the ledger, right? Yeah. It's a list of all those transactions. Any transactions that have included fees get added to that block reward. So that's typically pools do distribute that to miners, although some do keep them. So that's something you might want to look into. The fact that the fees go to the miners is incredibly important because if yes. it didn't, then when all the all the block potential coins are mined, the network would crash. Nobody would bother wasting electricity for nothing. Mm -hmm. See, the audience is so handsome and well-informed. It's very intimidating. The total mining, the total reward for finding a block. But the Bitcoin, the amount of Bitcoin created for a block halves every four years and it will take drop to nothing. And basically, we never, um, in, in a relatively equitable, uh, not in a relatively equitable fashion, um, the world's being seeded with the uh, bitcoins as they come into creation. Um, uh, it's better than uh, uh, you know the Bank of Canada gets all the new dollars <laughs> that come into uh, um, uh, existence. I mean, it's, it's great through the Bank of Canada. But the the uh, the miners. The miners are collectively being slowly weaned off of brand new bitcoins, and uh, will eventually, in about 2140, um, uh, eventually the uh, miners will um, will be paid only transaction fees. Anybody else? I got. If I mean, I got like three questions. Um, question number one. Uh, from what I've heard, theft is common. Is that a myth? Is it not that common, like a Bitcoin? Is it something that's been blown out of proportion? I don't know. Get the mic. <laughs> I've got the mic, so I guess it's me. Um, so, Bitcoin theft, I think that's a matter of perspective. Would you guys say that's kind of a matter of perspective? Um, I think it's troublingly commonplace um, because a lot of people are not uh, even reasonably well educated as to how to manage their Bitcoin themselves. So uh, they do keep a lot of them on exchanges, which frankly are not reliable. You are entrusting your Bitcoin to somebody else. It's kind of like storing your gold in a vault that is managed by somebody else and you don't really know whether or not they're trustworthy. Um, so I think that uh, though it is frighteningly commonplace, though it is absolutely a problem, the market is weaning out or is, is thinning out the bag market actors that exist. Uh, you see right now, for instance, CoinKite, which is a Canadian company, they have developed a, a way for people to actively prove reserves that the company is holding. So people can basically just look at them publicly and say, yeah, they have all their Bitcoin. You couldn't do that with empty docs. Um, and so I think that the market is evolving, but right now there's absolutely a problem with people entrusting their Bitcoin to, uh, Bitcoin to people who may take them away. And question about taxation. Uh, are there any regulations being introduced? Or plan to be introduced? I'm sure the government wants to get its money. I'm not sure if there's any regulations on the horizon, but it's definitely taxable. Uh, mining is income. I guess you're also going to deduct your expenses, but um, buying and selling Bitcoin for a profit, that's a capital gain. Maybe business income depends on how often you do it, but I would talk to an accountant. It's, so it's, 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 it's There's rulings. It's dependent on where you cash those out, right? So if you just have a zip stick and you take a trip to the Canary Islands, 
it's it's not a, it's 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 not income earned in Canada. You, you're, okay. It's not a case. It's not a tax on the worldwide income, regardless if you earn it in Canada, the internet, Bahamas. You can give up your citizenship and you won't be taxed. No, but 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 with regards to that, that that's not it's not a currency. And yeah. it's been ruled on that it's not a currency, therefore it's it's yeah. ones and zeros. And all, the yeah, Canadian yeah, government don't, doesn't don't recognize bitcoins as a legitimate yeah. currency. That's, that's they made a statement a few weeks ago. Yeah. They want they want to make their own virtual currency that's based on the Canadian dollar. Wow, great idea. <laughs> <laughs> but they said they don't view it as currency, so I would only consider that I'd have to pay taxes on it when I turn it into fiat yes. currency. Yes, uh, yeah. exactly. Like and then, you know. When's that going to happen? I mean, I don't See, know. I think any realized increase in value, the government's going to want a piece of that. Yeah, but they can. Too bad. That's what's. Uh, <laughs> so, how many people <laughs> here can't prove sell it. something on Kijiji and report it for taxable purposes? Oh, yeah. Me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and me too, I assure you. From, from, from what I I've lost. gathered, from the people that I've talked to at Revenue Canada, they won't tell me anything specific. In fact, usually what I get in response is, we'll have to get our solicitors to tell us what this is. Um, but from what I've understood, it's treated as a barter good. So, barter. 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 So, if you gain value, if you, especially if you trade, that is technically taxable. I encourage all of you. I am wearing an anarcho-capitalist pin, an anarchy pin. I encourage all of you deeply, with the deepest of convictions, to report every transaction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, wait, actually. Okay, I hope there's no CRA people. Your cap's increased in value, you don't want to be You're getting taxed. If your money increases in value, you you realize that you can't get taxed. Any other set is defined in different areas. Sometimes it's a currency, sometimes it's a commodity, depending on where you are. And the authorities schizophrenic of whether Bitcoin is money. If, if, if you're uh, exchanging large um, uh, large amounts of Bitcoin, well then you're money laundering. But in <laughs> But if you, you know, write it down on a copy with it, well it's we don't regulate that. <laughs> exactly. yeah. Yeah. If you write it down as other income, like if you don't have a business yeah, and just throw it down as other income on your keyboard. Uh, you're covered no matter what happens yeah. in the future. There's no no coming back for it. Well uh, I believe it's um, <coughs> Uh, losses from any American citizen, I believe it's any American citizens who um, lost money, any American citizens who got doxxed. That's become a word now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dorian Nakamoto got doxxed, but at least he didn't get doxxed. Uh, uh, can deduct their losses. <laughs> Uh, and carry them forward until all of their losses have been, uh, I've uh, saved them taxes. But that's, um, I, it's worth noting that Bitcoin is not anonymous, it is pseudonymous. Um, you know each, you, you can tell each, um, uh, for every tra Bitcoin transaction that happens, unless it's, uh, transferring of a wallet and trusting that the person giving the wallet doesn't have another copy. Uh, that transaction is in the blockchain. So it would be a really bad idea, for instance, to um, send some of your Bitcoin to the Al-Qaeda and use the change of that to buy stuff on overstock.com. <laughs> um, also, so because overstock isn't very good, you're saying? Or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because of Christmas. <laughs> yes. And I'm paying a great work. Yeah. Uh, there isn't forward secrecy. Uh, you're protected from future analysis. Um, I got one last question. So it sounds right, like right now, Regulations regarding air are a little murky when it comes to taxes. That's the just not basically getting at this point. If you made money, put it under return. It's a good under it's the other money. income? <laughs> that's a, that's a bigger the, playing the, the currency. Canadian lawyer from Vancouver in Las Vegas did a presentation, and that's exactly what she said. Yeah. Oh. Said, good if you're a minor, you don't have, uh, if you're not a business, put it down as other income, and the future 
you know, because if chain can be analyzed, you'll never be in trouble. And that's obviously the high tax way. Mm -hmm. But you're completely safe. So in, in that sense, she said, but it's, it's, it's only the totally concern. Agree with Ethan. If you yeah. saw something on like TV, you, you always write it down. I don't know. No. But, but it is only the concern when you convert your Bitcoin from Bitcoin to Canadian dollars. Right. Until you actually make the conversion, it doesn't have value. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Yeah. 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 I think that's debatable, and CRA likes to debate, so. So, uh, <laughs> how, how do they consider if I bought an ounce of gold? And in that, in, in a, the year that I bought the ounce of gold, it, it went up in value. Do I need to declare that? Increase in, increase in value, value or? I don't people do that. It, well, it's <laughs> yeah. not, it's not income. It would be capital gains. Yeah, it's capital so gains on a, on a commodity, right? So that's how I see bitcoins is like, you know, Un old. Unrealized gain yeah. is unrealized. Do you have to claim it? I don't know. You're the accountant. You tell me. If it's an unrealized gain, if it's just a, a book entry yeah. in the increase in value, uh, not until you realize the gain. And that means so. I would say oh yeah. Okay. So as far as you're concerned, your bitcoins are worth a buck in front of until you sell them for whatever. This is like there's something called you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. 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 So who knows what that would be safe? Declare your income. Yeah, it's safe as one last question. I don't want to dominate all the time here for their people. That's a good um, like it seems like Bitcoin, like it does have volatility right now. I'm just wondering how it does. How that works like with value when it comes to like payments to vendors and stuff, how do you determine like rate of exchange? Say you want to uh, pay two hundred dollars for something on uh, like on Amazon or something. Okay. I'll go over that quick. Um, I was asked this question at lunch the other day, um, uh, talking with people running a cafeteria and a residence at the university, and they're wondering like what Bitcoin would it be useful for here. And then I just in my inbox get, when I got back, uh, because of the symposium, people across the country started to like, email me and about their Bitcoin operations. And there's like, um, I think it's called Reliant 21. It's on my Twitter anyway. Uh, and they have a point of sale uh, device that converts uh, from Bitcoin into cash pretty quickly, which would reduce the risk that as businesses see it, as far as like, well, if I get a Bitcoin now, is it gonna be worth what it is at the end of the day? But if you're converting it right away, it's uh, pretty much eliminated your risk that way. I mean, at, at any point, too, the Canadian dollar could go down in value to the um, other global currencies, and we'd be stranded here in, in Canada with our, uh, our loonies uh, instead of our Bitcoins, for example. And mint chip. <laughs> <laughs> um, gentlemen. I had a question about, uh, it's a raw math question. It's my understanding that potential of the 21 million uh, bitcoins will have eight decimals apiece, right? And from the launch, 2009, and the adaption rates, um, the original thoughts were one of perhaps many first world currency, right? To be a global currency. So do you guys, are, is anybody aware of extrapolations mathematically to see the growth rate of adaptation relative to what we've had in the past five years. And from that, obviously, there's going to be a, a potential valuation put on those two because uh, some of the graphs I've seen, they have a, um, they have a technical pattern to them so far, right? Strides that effect, that kind of stuff. Every time there's a big crash, more people hear about it. Is it does anybody have technical information about that? Because one, one thing I had heard was it was designed to handle potentially every transaction globally for the next 300 years. Does, it, does anybody know the details around this? No. <laughs> it's a market. Yeah, I've heard a lot about, uh, about this in, in relation to how, what people predict the price is going to do, whether it's going to end up at like 300 a coin or 3,000 a coin or beyond that. But I don't have any specifics. I wonder if anybody else here does. This is the kind of thing I'm hoping, like somewhere in the room, there, if there's a brave soul that doesn't like public speaking, oh, I, I see. No, you can't predict either way. Pockets can't be predicted. That's the whole point. I think I think that's probably spot on. Um, I I don't I don't entirely understand specifically what you're asking. Let, let, let me articulate this. Try globally with all currencies. Right? Uh, currencies are a human manifestation. We made them up. 
Mm -hmm. There is an aggregate value of those currencies every year. I think it's around $85 trillion of total value, right? So from $85 trillion, you have bitcoins that are going to cap out at $21 million with eight decimal points, right? How long is it relative to what's happened in the first five years? to have total adaption to that. Oh. This, is a, this is a mathematical question. It's not a theoretical question, but there has been stuff raised on it. I'm not a math guy, right? There's some pretty yeah. clever fellows here. I was wondering if anybody had gone through this. this, well, this worst case, you can always think more decimal places can always be added on. That's yeah. been discussed too. So the divisibility is not an issue. We can always go down to 16 decimal places or whatever it takes. So the 21 well, million. You know that. Yeah, the 21 million cap is not going to be an issue because um, there'll be enough bitcoins to go around forever, and we'll just add more decimal places. Yeah, yes. but at what point does it no longer become feasible to do to, to add decimal places? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, if you have, uh, if I'd like to send, you know, two thousand dollars to, I didn't catch your name, but sure. if I want to send two thousand dollars, and you know, I need sixteen decimal places to do it, it's no longer a feasibility. For two branded sixteen decimal places, that's not feasible. Well, you're talking about simple expressions of numbers. I mean, yeah. really. I've always thought, you know, referring to Bitcoin as a Bitcoin is very misleading because, in fact, you're referring to 100 million units, yeah. right? Yeah. I've always thought we should just be talking about Satoshi, yeah. um, Satoshi's individual units, which to some people might seem ridiculous because you'd be th by talking about a coffee costing what? Like a, a, a Satoshi. Okay, so a Satoshi is the base unit of a Bitcoin, right? One Bitcoin is divisible into 100 million units. Each unit is referred to individually as a Satoshi. So if you're buying a cup of coffee, what would that cost? Like something like a million Satoshi or something? Um, so to some people that might seem like a ridiculous value of expression, or an, an asinine way to refer to uh, a number uh, attached to a transaction. Dogecoin, yes. Um, but I don't think it's so ridiculous or far-fetched. Really all you're talking about is there's a decimal that's confusing not only is that solvable in terms of uh, developing a standard for how you express that number, but also it's it's a software problem too, right? You you can you can standardize that expression uh, through uh, uh, developing millibits. Sure. Yeah. yeah. That nonsense. I lots of people love it. I think it's nonsense. But um, but yeah. So uh, when it comes to Bitcoin basically becoming a gigantic world currency, that's what everybody uses. I don't know if that's going to happen, but if that is what happens, Bitcoin certainly can be adapted to uh, uh, to, to take on those number of expressions fairly easily. It's not really a problem. Go make you next time. Uh, it doesn't take up any more space in the blockchain to uh, send 100 million uh, Satoshis than it does to send 10 Satoshis. Uh, the, uh, how many of these units will ever last? 21 million. 2.1 quadrillion? quadrillion? Sure. Bits. It's uh, <laughs> a pretty big number. I believe that's right. Uh, it's like a chocolate uh, 100, uh, 100 million times 21 million. <clears throat> and if uh, if it actually does become a problem that uh, people want to transact in units smaller than the base unit, uh, it will be possible to, uh, I think it would require a hard fork, which basically means it would require everyone in, in the world to agree that, uh, well, the Bitcoin network works like this now. but. We do see uh, uh, hard forks um, uh, now and then uh, in uh, the various altcoins. Well, actually, Bitcoin had one last week. Mm -hmm. it, it's what caused the crash uh, when we, well, part of what caused the NT dogs crash last April. From mm -hmm. the 0.8 to 0.9 client, I think it was. Yeah, there's yeah, a big clients for generating blocks of people to be eating. Okay, we have time for one more question. I'm sorry, the guy on this way. Well, we're all good till 9.30. Sorry, about 9 o'clock, you know. I love all handling, so that's the thing. That's what's driving me. Anyway, okay, you go, sir. Hi, um, 
Um, so I'm pretty new to Bitcoin. I've tried like learning about it on my own and everything, but the part I'm still confused on is they have this cap at 21 million um, to be reached by 2140 or whatever it is. Uh, I'm just confused on how that is enforced. Like what's, since it's all open source, what's stopping people from going in and changing it to 22 million or changing the amount of blocks that you can produce? Just to sum it up anyway, it's when the software that you would download from uh, bitcoin.org is installed that everybody has collectively designed, the algorithm that it's running to create bitcoins, is that it's actually hard coded into that and it would take like a hard fork like Marshall uh, noted, or noted to change how the amount could be even recognized, like if you added more decimals, because that software right now doesn't support that. And everybody would have to agree to install new software that understands that new rule. So, so it could be done, like if, oh, yeah. if you went and Peace changed, changed new software, is that where the new types of coins? Like if you, you add new decimals, decimals, then yes, you're technically adding new coins. Oh, no. Not no, new coins, no, but no, you you're way adding new fractions. Them, right? <laughs> yeah, you're, adding, you're fractionizing the others. So you could think of, like, if you add another decimal, you're adding uh, 10 times as many. Uh, but you're actually still working with the same number of coins initially, you're just expressing them differently. But I thought that very quickly off the cuff. It's worth noting that uh, fiat currencies have three decimal lines in the past. Uh, I, 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 uh, I, I, I want to uh, make sure I point out uh, that anarchy does not mean lack of rules or uh, disorder. You, um, you, you, can have author um, uh, you, you can have authoritarianism, and well, often where there's authoritarianism, you have um, in, 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 inconsistent uh, application of rules and disorder. Uh, Bitcoin is anarchic, it is a laissez-faire uh, currency, but it has hard rules that are enforced by uh, by the miners, basically. Uh, uh, if a miner uh, cracked a block, but said, and I'm going to pay this, this reward of 26 bitcoins to myself, all of the, um, all, all, all the other miners would uh, would say, well, no, that's not a valid block, and they keep trying to crack uh, the, uh, the next block uh, without uh, without that reward of 26 bitcoins. It's the same thing. It's the same. Uh, it's the same way you can't uh, send to take two bitcoins from your uh, from your wallet and send those three bitcoins to someone else. It, it's um, it, it's. It infor um, it's enforced by this peer-to-peer um, -peer network. There are rules, and they are enforced. Okay, so I guess I would add to that question. Like the miners, the miners make the rules. So if if you wanted to make more than twenty-one million bitcoins, just get the majority of the mining power on the network, and you can do whatever you want. So there's nothing stopping on that from happening. Right? You go, girl. <laughs> <laughs> so next question. Um, what is your question, sir? It kind of goes to my question, too. Uh, much has been said about uh, Bitcoin being decentralized, but we have been hearing more about developers, and uh, who are these developers, and are they elected? Uh, yes, they are elected. They're uh, members of the Bitcoin Foundation. They actually just held a, uh, a large election process recently. Uh, one of our Virginia guys was up for election. He didn't get it. <laughs> he, I, I would take great exception to how you're describing this. Um, developers are not elected. The Bitcoin Foundation does not manage or curate Bitcoin. The Bitcoin Foundation is an independent market actor, just like any other advocacy group out there that expresses a desire for promoting, standardizing, and protecting uh, the use of Bitcoin around the world. That's the Bitcoin Foundation's mission statement. Um, the Bitcoin Foundation pays Gavin Andreessen, their chief scientist, which is a really rockin' cool job title. Uh, they pay him a salary. 
I believe he's the only full-time Bitcoin developer out there paid by the foundation. However, again, that doesn't mean that developers are elected. Gavin Andreessen has the privilege of being allowed to uh, submit changes to Bitcoin's protocol, the code, to spruce it up, to add features, to take them away, and everybody else has that privilege as well. Every single person on the planet. You can go, you can have everybody in the Bitcoin Foundation say, we want a change in the code that is this. You can have one other person from the middle of Russia say, no, I want the change to be this. And at that point, it's up to the miners to then adopt either for whatever, right? So no, they're not elected. Nothing about Bitcoin is centralized. I mean, nothing about Bitcoin is centralized. Um, even when it comes to Bitcoin Foundation, it is not a curatorial organization. I actually meant to clarify this. Uh, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't, didn't the clarification so much is shot that the Bitcoin Foundation is the fork that people generally follow. Because it's, yes. it's the trusted side of it. So if they make a change, more often than not, that's the change that goes into it. Yeah, yeah. I predict that's going to change. Yeah, that will change. Well, I'll too. just add to that some people have an advantage. If you possess a domain name that has some clout like bitcoin.org, <laughs> yes. then obviously if you're connected to that, whatever you put on that website, people are more likely to download that software yeah. rather than a competitor who's written their version of Bitcoin that has a new rule in it. So Which is just, where we get a lot of the altcoins from. Yeah, so that, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, exactly. That's what people have done to create Dogecoin and, and Litecoin and, and others. They've done that exactly. My last one is, do you see some kind of regulation for why in the future? So right now, there's a fellow in New York, his name is Ben Lasky, and uh, his nickname is Super Nintendo Lasky because somebody typoed his name when they were posting to Reddit, which is great. Um, so Ben Lasky, as the superintendent of whatever financial services department, whatever, uh, he's trying to create a, a regulatorily friendly zone in New York when it comes to Bitcoin, um, which is interesting. To me, it doesn't really matter. When, when you're talking about global regulation of Bitcoin, I think what you will see in the short term is global regulation of Bitcoin businesses. Businesses that use Bitcoin, they will be regulated, uh, but Bitcoin itself is a communication protocol. I don't think it can be regulated. You can't really regulate uh, a messaging system uh, it, that is also decentralized. There's no office to go to to say, change the rules so it does this, right? You cannot regulate that. It is completely uh, anarchic in that sense. So global regulation, I don't know about global regulation of Bitcoin businesses, that's possible. Um, but certainly there, uh, there is a, a, a really hard effort right now to figure out in various jurisdictions uh, where Bitcoin does fit in terms of how businesses are using it. Uh, that, that's a puzzle for a lot of governments right now. It's kind of entertaining to watch them figure it out. It's nothing new for uh, uh, governments, laws, and regulatory bodies to have a hard time keeping up with new technologies. Um, ECRs? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Napster. <laughs> uh, the, uh, Netflix would not have such a problem with um, their uh, making sure that they can get the uh, streams to everyone who wants them if uh, intellectual property law would allow the um, would allow uh, relaying of the in, uh, uh, of the studio's intellectual property uh, from Netflix servers to uh, some Netflix customers to other customers, basically make it a, uh, a decentralized streaming service as I believe uh, the BitTorrent folks are working on right now. But it's, and that, that, that's a wonderful technology, let, let the consumers do have, the, uh, have your content distribution uh, for you, maybe um, give them a discount. But the laws haven't caught up to the technology. It's, Nothing. There's an open mic for people that are looking. Does anyone else have any further questions? Oh, there's someone rushing from the back. Someone's rushing from the back, looking yeah. sharply dressed. My, that's good. Well done. That's a <laughs>
Um, I guess my question kind of goes back to uh, the confirmations. So right now, one of the things that's stopping Bitcoin from being a, uh, a service to exchange money for, for products is the long confirmation time. Sometimes it can take 10 minutes up to 20 minutes before a single confirmation. And usually people will say that uh, transactions have been confirmed until about oh, three. So is that problem being addressed? Or are there ways to circumvent that sort of limitation? It's simple. You you confer you address that at the business end of uh, end of things. It's, it's the same idea works for your debtor. Your bank, uh, your business bank, uh, trusts the bank that it has money. But your debit transaction doesn't go through to the uh, to the business until end of day. Bitcoin's actually much faster than current methods. Uh, the problem is, is banks are a lot more trusted currently right. in this. So I mean, for example use the network, you know, uh, this advantage can't be understated when you're looking at, you know, uh, a 5% uh, additional cost on top of uh, whatever it is you're selling, right? So you sell something for a hundred bucks and you got to pay $5. That's a, that's a significant cost, right? Especially when compared to the Bitcoin network, which will cost you what, like five cents? I think the transaction fees are being reduced 10 times, tenfold now uh, in the very near future if they haven't been already. So yeah. Uh, back before, I'm just going to like point out this old-fashioned technology here. Um, remember, we used to swipe in Canada, and now they only do that in the States, apparently. Um, with these, we always trusted that a signature that matches what you sign on a piece of paper matches the card. And we still have an authorized signature. Mine says, meat popsicle. Uh, there, there was a uh, comedy on, on Zug.com uh, years ago about uh, the fellow who, I think he drew a, uh, he signed his Shamu and he, uh, or he just started drawing weird things on the signature line and nobody ever looked. And so I started doing that too and it was true and nobody, nobody ever looked. Like, we just, if you have the card, you're trusted. And we'll, we're still building the culture about what to do with trust in, in Bitcoin. And that's what's really interesting about this. And, and I think, yeah, you can accept a transaction that has zero confirmations. That's pretty much however I've ever done it person to person. Because first, you don't have time to chase after them five minutes later. But the odds that the person you're dealing with actually had, knows how to double spend and, and do crazy things and, and rob you that way, it's not going to happen. I have a question. Has there been a recorded instance of a double spend? No, well, there's I a lot of attempts on the on the blockchain. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. been no no none no of them have ever gotten a copy. No seeing stale hash. Yeah. So I guess keep your client connected to as many other clients as you can. That will protect you from a double spend. Yeah. Um, I'd like to point out that um, a percentage of fraud uh, is currently a cost of doing business for online retailers dealing in fiat currency. In addition to the uh, few percent uh, for, um, uh, debit or for for taking debit or credit, the um, uh, people do that with credit cards. They, they uh, order something, they and then they dispute the uh, they dispute the charge. It's that is currently a problem with the old system. It is not, it does not seem to be a problem. Currently, with Bitcoin. Hmm. Well, transaction eligibility isn't that exactly what it is. You must have been so happy. When you swoop the transaction ID, you get paid out from the exchange, you swoop the transaction ID, and then go back to them and say that I didn't get paid. That's exactly that. Mm. That's the main, that's one of the main attacks. Right? That, that is what that that's is. That's one of the excuses that they use. What's going yeah. on? <laughs> It is certainly an excuse, and it was definitely an excuse on the on the part of Mark Rapelli, the guy who uh, ran Mount Gox into the ground. He um, he was saying the transaction malleability because their automated systems uh, sent people their Bitcoin that request withdrawal. People would then request, you know, they change the the transaction ID, which is not really a transaction ID. It's probably a bad idea to call it that. Um, and then they'd go back to the automated system and say, look, the transaction ID you sent me. There's no transaction there, so send it to me again. Um, but that's the real problem with that, in my eyes, in my untechnical view, is that this is a bug that was known of for a long time. There were lots of uh, uh, implementations of uh, the Bitcoin client for uh, exchanges that took care of that bug. Um, Mark Carpelles, uh, because he was a diehard PHP programmer, didn't want to change. Uh, 
if transaction malleability actually affected enough gox, we don't really know if it did. Um, that was an unacceptable mistake uh, on his part. Absolutely unacceptable because everybody else seemed to be quite in tune with that, and for good reasons, because that, a fix to that had been standardized what, a year and a half ago or something. Sure, but it does specify there's people or software that will, can actually do that. Or it's a whole lot. I mean, there's, there's, there's players out there that are Unless yeah, they can, they, they can do that, but if you have a very standardized set of rules within your implementation, if you're, if you're a Bitcoin exchange, for example, then it's not only totally avoidable, it just doesn't work anymore. So um, it's, it's a bug that's been patched, basically. So I guess if you, if you have uh, an implementation that doesn't take care of that, that doesn't patch it, then yeah, I guess it's a problem. But same for a moment, uh, assuming for a moment that it is uh, it was an exploit of a transaction, a transaction malleability uh, related exploit that uh, allowed uh, someone to, or people to uh, steal um, something like 5% of all the Bitcoins uh, currently in existence from uh, empty docs. The, uh, first of all, their accounting systems should have picked up on it. Second of all, the, um, the, uh, the call support people should have noticed. We, we're, we're getting all these calls from people saying they, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, they haven't received their payments. And, well, actually, I, um, I, I, I know someone who um, uh, tried to make withdrawal uh, from Mount Gox and didn't receive the payment. Um, and then um, talked to them and did get her Bitcoin out shortly before they <laughs> spend it. Uh, it's like the uh, day before they sealed yeah, it. Yeah, something like that. Uh, and thirdly, uh, their accounting should have picked up that, hey, we have Bitcoins missing. Um, right. It seems like with Bitcoin, you know, there's all this stuff, this stuff like that. Firstly, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Like, what, the Canadian company that went down was like $70,000? It's not really a large number. 700000 but 700000 on a billion is not a lot. It seems like the step that is occurring is with personal blockchain. Like, not blockchain, but wallets, right? Like, empty gox was using their own wallet. I've never heard of a Bitcoin theft from an actual Bitcoin wallet where you have to give away your password. It's just like, the flaw in the system is not the system itself, it's just mm -hmm. unimportant users, right? Like, if you're stupid enough to put your money on exchange, they say, don't put your money on exchange. You're mining. Don't keep your money in the wire. <clears throat> like, take it out, put it in a secure location. Like, Bitcoin, as far as I can see, is extremely secure. It's just that mainly banks are hammering on it because, like, why do It's frictionless, right? If I can transfer $1,000 or $0.07, cents, the only reason for a bank to exist at this point is to give me a loan. Like, they don't need to buy more Bitcoin. Yeah, they don't need to hold my money. Like, if I can transfer my money to you or I can transfer money to a business, that's that's exactly what money is supposed to be. We're going to transfer it. Originally, we created banks so we could hold our wealth. Because me walking around with a bunch of bars of gold back in the day was not a safe idea. So you don't need to put my money somewhere safe. And they made it, oh, you can transfer your money cheaply. Well, <clears throat> with Bitcoin now, it's just, it's finally updated money so we can move our wealth around. But it's, it's, as far as I can see, it's extremely secure. It just seems like the issue with Bitcoin itself is people not, no, not, ah, people not knowing how to use it and the users not knowing how to use it. But that, that is a problem, though. Yeah. I mean, I if we're talking about a globalized like, currency, well, people have to know how to use it. Is <coughs> the, like, I mean, uh, I've been uh, a computer technician for years and years and years and years and years, and I can tell you one thing and one thing only. Malware is not the internet's fault. It's not Facebook's fault for giving you malware. It's your fault for not having it removed. I mean, like it's, yeah, it, 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 this is your computer, it's your job. Half of antivirus software, from what I understand, doesn't even recognize like some of this malware in yeah. Bitcoin. Yeah. So how can it be your fault? You I understand it's being done. If you have an Apple computer, that your point didn't infect you. You went somewhere you got to infect. There's like, right now there are there are market-based solutions that are trying to address this. For instance, you have the well uh, at this point vaporware treasure hardware wallet, right? Um, there, there are ways to uh, make this secure for individuals that really have no mind of uh, how to uh, use a computer to actually properly secure Bitcoin, right? So 
you, people like me. Um, I, I am not an IT guy, and I have seen lots of IT guys say, wow, I had my Bitcoin stolen, and I thought that this would be totally safe the way I had it set up. But truth be told, you know, it, it, it's very simple to slip up with this stuff. So the market is trying to address that by providing people with things like hardware wallets that uh, don't uh, that don't touch a network, right? Uh, places where you can store Bitcoin securely without having to worry about somebody, you know, just crafting your password or getting your password by a keylogger or something like that. There are solutions like that being developed. And I think that has to happen because I don't expect everybody to, I don't think it's reasonable to expect everybody to just become, you know, computer security experts. That's not going to happen. I think that's a great answer. Uh, uh, we can see I don't know if you guys have seen this coin kite, the terminal yeah. they've got. They've got a debit card that goes in the terminal. So if you have your Bitcoins uh, on one of their cards, it's just like using a debit card. So I really think, you know, technological innovations like that are going to be you know, going to address that problem. And I've ordered one of those coin kite machines. It should be here next month. And I've got a bunch of those cards coming too. So I would like to uh, voice a potentially. Um, uh, Potentially controversial opinion that uh, if and when uh, old style bankers uh, start dealing with Bitcoin, I think that'll actually be really good for Bitcoin. Because these are people who are very risk averse, who are uh, versed in uh, dealing with other people's money safely. <laughs> uh, of course, that risk aversion is keeping them away from Bitcoin altogether right now. Um, I, I'd also like to point out that uh, today's security problems are, in my opinion, partly actually fault of the people who designed the systems in the first place. The um, the fundamental architecture of, uh, of computer systems. We, we should not still be finding buffer overflow vulnerabilities. That is a known issue. We should not be writing programs that, have, that, that don't have the uh, uh, boundary checks in place. Uh, our programming tools um, should do that for us, and many of them do, but it's... Um, a lot of people don't most people don't understand computers. Also, the computers are, they should not be this hard to secure. <clears throat> okay, uh, John's gonna voice his opinion, but I think we can wrap it up pretty quick. We have like around seven minutes. I still want you guys to kind of socialize at the end. And John, your opinion on it? Get socializing. I, I'm gonna just leave the last uh, few minutes to, uh, to let people uh, again, trade business cards, trade ideas, uh, explain if you've set up a miner how you went about doing it, uh, make some good connections, and uh, uh, I'm hoping Nathan will say something about Crash Bang Labs too. Do you want to do that? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, we're doing that. Okay, go on, go with that. Crash Bang Labs. Hi, everybody. Um, so, uh, I'm uh, the secretary and the president of Crash Plan Labs. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for coming out and having such great questions and uh, perhaps intimidating our panel a little bit with your expertise. Um, if you, in case you haven't heard of us yet, Crash Bang is a uh, relatively new startup. We've been around for a couple of years. We're a cooperatively managed nonprofit devoted to providing people in the community with opportunities to learn about the relationship between right. technology, arts and crafts, community building, and uh, basically understanding how things work. Um, we have inventors, computer hackers, and artists who all interact together and learn from each other. It's a wonderful experience. And uh, we are now working on building some relationships with other groups in the community, such as, for example, the Queen City Hub, that graciously offered to host for us, as well as uh, John Klein and other guests. So we thank you all for coming out. And uh, just a little plug, uh, we are 100% self-funded at the moment. We have no grant money. We, we operate entirely off of donations and membership dues. So uh, we uh, encourage you to consider joining because 
the more people who get involved, the bigger the movement grows. And the same thing applies for all of these other groups that we're working with. It's uh, wonderful to see the community coming together like this. Do you have so, a website? Uh, yes, uh, our website is crashbanglabs.org. Uh, do not go to .com. That is uh, some kind of manga designer from the United States or something. It's crashbanglabs.org. Uh, we run a blog, and uh, there's an online forum where people communicate. We also have a Facebook page. Would you accept the Quinn for membership? Uh, have you got that set up yet? We are in the process of working on it, but I don't think we've got it up yet. Um, Just open it up. Bitcoin wallet. tonight if you need it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. We have enough brain power for that. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Please uh, socialize. Oh, we have one more question. Yeah, is this going to be a um, regular get-together? John can answer that. Sure. Um, in arranging for tonight, uh, we had so many people who wanted to speak that we have another four lined up already for May. Uh, we haven't picked the date in May, so if anyone has a big preference late in May, then uh, let us know. We have to, of course, make sure it doesn't conflict with Cathedral Village Arts and a whole bunch of other fun stuff that goes on around that time. But that's uh, around the approximate time that I want to have the next one. Uh, maybe we'll have this space again if uh, Queen City Hub uh, uh, likes us and if we donated enough and all that stuff too. So um, uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, it's been a great evening. It's been awesome. Potential next uh, meeting in May. I'm suggesting the topic would be dog coin, the search for more money. Um, I think that's the future right there. <laughs> I, I, I'm partial to jokes, guys. So thank you very much. You guys have a great evening. You take care. And thank our panelists. They came from everywhere. Great set of one. Sign 30. Go to all handlers. Thank you. Uh, yeah. user issues. Ah, okay. oh, user error. <laughs> That's easily fixed. Why, why do you ask? Please feel oh, free to uh, you buy your moderator drink. You I'm just saying. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, no, I've got a new one coming in right away. Actually.